Well, good morning, everyone, and we want to thank you for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions COVID-19 Response Committee webinar, a virtual African Financial Symposium, the Economic Impacts of COVID-19 on Credit Unions. It is brought to you today in conjunction with the African Confederation of Cooperative Savings and Credit Association, or COSCA, and the Kenya Union of Savings and Credit Cooperatives, or CUSCO. We have a great agenda today, including a presentation on how COVID-19 is impacting Kenyan credit unions. We'll be joined, joined uh, on that by George Toto. He is a World Council Board Director, as well as the CEO of Cusco. We'll hear about the pandemic challenges for African credit unions on the Pan-African scale. That's from George Mbato. He is the Executive Director of Acosca. We'll get a SACO's perspective on COVID-19 from Joe, George Ochiri. He is the CEO of Harambi SACO, one of the largest SACOs in Kenya. Then we'll hear from Steve Otieno, Chief Operating Officer for the Cooperative Alliance of Kenya. He'll talk about how Kenyan cooperatives as a whole are responding to the pandemic. And then COVID-19 impacts on credit unions in Malawi from Fumbani Niangulu, CEO of the Malawi Union of Savings and Credit Cooperatives. And then finally, we'll be joined later in the program by Dr. Elizabeth Gummerson. She is the Executive Director for Performance Monitoring for Action at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She will have a presentation on her recent study on the economic impacts of COVID-19 on Sub-Saharan Africa. And just a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have any questions for our speakers, you can please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type them in there. And I can ask them to the speakers as time allows. We do have a full agenda, but as time allows today. And also today's webinar is being recorded. It will be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. That is at youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash W-O-C-C-U. And without further ado, we're gonna start with George Toto. He is the CEO of the Kenya Union of Savings and Credit Cooperatives, one of World Council's direct member organizations in Africa. That's a post he's held since 2010. And he is also a member of World Council's board of directors since 2016. Mr. Atoto has been awarded a state commendation in the category of the Moran of the Order of the Burning Spear for his development of SACOs in Kenya. He holds an MBA degree in finance law and a Bachelor of Arts in mathematics and economics. He is also a certified public accountant and an international credit union development educator. Mr. Atoto, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I appreciate uh, having me here. Uh, we are all aware of the impact of what we are faced with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. But when we look at uh, what we are faced with at the moment, then I would refer to it as um, a black swan. That is in the sense that um, the predictability is not very easy. And it, is an, uh, it was unseen until uh, December last year when it began in Wuhan. But we also need to appreciate that these global pandemics are quite rare. Generally, the impact is huge. And the impact I'm referring to here is both health and also economic. We also have issues to do with psychological biases, which we are faced with. And, uh, if we try to quantify what we are faced with, then it can only be post this kind of situation that we can be able to quantify how much cost has been uh, suffered in terms of opportunity cost and also in terms of uh, the health crisis that it has caused. You look at some of our budgets, um, like I have increased our health budget by about half a million US dollars or so far spent, we still do not know to what extent we are going to go. Now, we know of different crises that we have faced worldwide. One of them was the financial crisis. But you see, unlike this one, that was specific. It was a financial crisis. In our situation now, we are faced with a health crisis, but we are also likely to be faced with the financial crisis or a recession going forward. Now, in a country like Kenya, we've had different interventions. And uh, as I have mentioned earlier, on the crisis perspective, we have the element of social distancing for us 
to mitigate against the spread of this virus. In a country like this, we also had curfews. And the curfews are still running as we talk today, other than for essential services and also transport of commodities or, or, or foodstuffs. We have also had, at one point, there was a lockdown where the members of the population were not allowed to move from one county to another and restrictions kind of slowed down this problem. Now, on the economic front, we have seen quite a number of uh, job losses. Loan defaults also, we have witnessed and quite a number of uh, 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 borrowers or loanees asking for loan restructuring. We have also seen a uh, uh, rise in the cases of uh, companies that are going into bankruptcy. And uh, inflation generally is up. The cost of uh, food stuff like uh, commodities in this country has also gone up. From the social perspective, we have had a lot of cases of, uh, of, of, of domestic violence, which have been uh, reported, and also general depression from a number of uh, staff even that we have, and uh, interventions to do with the uh, mental talks have also been ongoing. Now, there have been a number of strategic interventions, first of all, from the government. Some of them were tax-based, for example, reduction of turnover taxes. We have also had reduction of the value-added tax. Uh, we have also seen the increased disbursement of accumulated VAT refunds just to help uh, com uh, companies come back into business and also 100% tax waiver for the low income segments of our community. For example, up to uh, 2,400 US dollars or 2,400 US dollars per month have been exempted from taxation. We've also seen monetary interventions in terms of reduction of central bank rate and also the cash reserve for banks have also been reduced by the central bank. We've also seen flexible provisioning of loans by the central bank to enable uh, the banks delist the, uh, the, 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 the borrowers who have got minimum borrowings of about ten dollars to not to be listed with the uh, CRB. Now we have also seen the fiscal interventions like reduction of uh, PAYE from a threshold of 30 percent to 25 percent. We've also seen the corporate tax that have been reduced also from 30 to 25 percent. We have also seen the issue of pending bills that were owed to quite a number of institutions in this country that have been also reduced. Now, but if we look across board, there are some sectors which are more affected than others. For example, the airline industry and the travel industry collapsed basically. We have also seen issues to do with the hotels or hospitality industry, which collapsed and only about 10% to 15% has been operating. Uh, the supply chain, only a third. Education sector in totality has been disorganized in the context that schools were closed during this time and children are not going to school now. If you look at public schools, probably they are funded by the exchequer, but the private schools have lost totally because they derived their income from the students that they were giving uh, the training services to. And a number of their staff have also lost their jobs. And that means that after that they have lost uh, a livelihood. In that context of closer, closure of schools, we have realized that the, the supply chain system that was uh, supplying these schools with uh, vegetables, for example, with the school supplies like books or stationery, have also lost big time. The transport companies that had been uh, uh, outsourced to offer transport services are also lost. So if we try to condense the education sector alone, we realize that the loss there has been quite high. The health sector as well. During the peak of the pandemic, we are told by those who run hospitals and the cooperatives that are associated with them that people avoided going to the hospitals because first of all, the government asked them to avoid going to the hospitals unless they're critically ill. So they also lost the, the credit unions that are affiliated to these institutions also lost. And when they lost, it means that after that, loans were uh, defaulted. We have also seen even the night economy. In our country, we have a 24-hour economy. 
So there are some segments of the economy that have been relying on that night of economy, like the hawkers and the rest. Those ones also lost the club life that some people used to enjoy and also used to give the owners some income, also lost. The financial sector as well, in terms of loan rescheduling, as a result of people not repaying their loans and quite significant amounts of money have been rescheduled at the moment. Our flower industry, the horticulture industry, our main market has been Europe, and because of the COVID, flowers could not be transported to Amsterdam for auctioning. So they lost also a lot. Uh, we have seen other impacts in the financial sector, for example, the real estate sector. So quite a number of credit unions, ours inclusive, rely on the real estate sector in terms of the buildings that we put up for purchase, we have quite, quite a bit of stock, not just us, but quite a number of credit unions as well, and housing cooperatives. The same applies to other investors in the same segment. Now, the insurances or the insurance companies, and we run one here, uh, a mutual insurance company, we saw a significant reduction in terms of people who are patronizing these services and a drop in premium. The reason being, a number of these people were relying on small kind of uh, savings on a monthly basis to access insurances. So we have seen this. Our Nairobi uh, Securities Exchange, where quite a number of credit unions also invest in the shares, we, we, we witnessed a bear run in the, in the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Now, what we have again seen at the end of it all, given uh, that there has been a lot of sensitization programs going on in our country, is that we have seen quite a bit of behavior change. There has been a decline in terms of um, uh, people's activities or uh, the, the way occasionally they, they, they go, for example, to educational seminars, conferences like uh, we do have uh, uh, every week. We saw a significant drop. So there was a bit of uh, behavior change. Even up to now, uh, the issue of greeting each other stopped. We also encouraged the, uh, the cooperatives and uh, the credit unions in particular to sensitize uh, their members through mobile uh, services, uh, bulk uh, messaging, to educate their members first to do social distancing. Number two, avoid crowding in the banking halls and if possible, not to travel to the banking halls, but access services through mobile platforms. We have also encouraged people and uh, our members specifically to leverage on use of technology to disburse money and to avoid use of cash because we realize that cash is also one of the ways through which this can uh, be, 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 be spread. Uh, we also advised members, for example, to increase loan monitoring because quite a number of our, our circles have opened com their bonds. So we call uh, such the open common bonds. And a number of uh, members who are not within the common bond are technically businessmen. And because businesses were affected, we realized that loan defaults were going to be there. So we expected our members to continuously engage with them to allow them restructure their loans where possible and occasionally maybe come for small scale loans to enable them to continue with uh, their activities. Uh, if you look at all these things that are happening in the economy, and uh, given that the circle sector is, is just like about 30% of the entire economy, we have seen a, a situation where uh, credit unions that were associated with the small, uh, the, the small and the micro enterprises within the industrial area are not going to come back into business from the look of things because the companies themselves have already lost out. A number of them have already closed shop. And that therefore means the loan defaults in those small uh, credit unions is going to have uh, a, a, a ripple effect in the general the circle space. So those are some of the issues that we have witnessed here and the interventions that the government plus the, 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 the circle advocates like us have, have, have tried to ensure that the business run. But a significant proportion of small scale circles for sure will never come back. Now, I would I always like a quote from uh, Peter Drucker, 
And I quote, a time of turbulence is one of great opportunity for those who understand, accept, and exploit the new realities. Now, the truth of the matter is we are having the so-called the new normal. But I really doubt if it is the real no new normal. I think it's abnormal times where uh, very drastic decisions must be made in terms of ensuring that the SACO membership or the credit union membership does not get decimated as a result of, uh, of, of the disease. And therefore, uh, careful planning and management of our personal lives is key. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Atoto. Uh, interesting to hear that country perspective from Kenya. And I know there's a, a lot of SACOs and credit unions there that, man, and also elsewhere in Africa that get a lot out of that information and are probably dealing with a lot of the things that you're mentioning. Um, up next is George Mbato. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the African Confederation of Cooperative Savings and Credit Association. He, uh, ACOSCA, that's an institution that supports development of cooperative financial institutions in Africa. In this role, he has spearheaded strategic planning for a number of financial cooperatives. He is also a board member of the Africa Cooperative Development Foundation, and he is also the current director of Africa Development Educators Program and holds an ICUDE designation as well. George? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Greg, and thank you for the time that we are having discussing the topical issues currently affecting uh, the globe. I'll uh, begin by saying uh, this has changed the manner in which we are thinking. I'm currently in Liberia and the hall that people are listening to uh, this conversation. It has 40 leaders across the country uh, with government officials. I know the same is happening in the Republic of Gambia. I know the same is happening in the Republic of Ghana. We've taken different approaches to reach out to this conversation. So with the, with the, with the pandemic, I'll save uh, a couple of things regarding when you look at the economic impact and probably I'll also realign myself with what George uh, Otot has said that the impacts of COVID-19 might not be known up to a certain period. It might be too early to know the impact, but what we've observed and what you see on the screen is uh, a training, uh, the development educators program that uh, the Africans um, uh, met. We had the D program and we had it at a time where it seemed impossible to do it. It clearly reflects the resilience of, this, uh, of the credit union professionals uh, across Africa. Uh, in a manner that we know that COVID-19 is a, dis a, a disruptor, just like any other disruption that may, may have occurred in Africa from floods to Ebola, to many other things that we might be struggling with as a continent. The board of Akoska, uh, when uh, you look at uh, the next, we, uh, the next slide, what the board of Akoska, uh, thought of uh, at the initial stage uh, was to see how can we show commitment to our membership across the continent during this particular time. The screen you're seeing is the full board of Akoska with the word Akoska is committed to empowering people living in Africa through the financial cooperatives. What I like about this particular phrase is it shows that our mission does not change even if you're having this kind of distortion. Our mission does not change and the commitment does not change even if we're having the current challenges that we're having. The leadership with the chairmanship of Cambridge from Eswatini, I know they believe that there could be other distortions in the near future. And theirs as a team is to think through and develop a stability, develop a credit union system in the continent that will be able to withstand this kind of uh, this kind of disruption. If you look at Africa as a whole, before COVID-19, we were struggling with a couple of things. And I can mention countries from Ghana before the uh, COVID-19, 
There are already challenges regarding uh, the financial investment that the credit union had put into investment trusts in the countries and they were locked down. And the huge, huge investment, putting almost the national associations and the bigger credit union to a very difficult point. When I go to Liberia too, they were already experiencing challenges just after the aftermath of Ebola after the aftermath of the, the conflict, which is a distortion or a disruptor. When I go to Cameroon, I'll also feel the same. There's huge disruption happening in, in Cameroon at the moment, where the, the number of conflict from one region to the other, making it difficult for the credit union to, to operate. And when you look at this across the continent, the struggle has been there. But one positive thing that emerges in terms of the economic outlook before uh, COVID-19, it was projected by World Bank and many other stakeholders uh, looking at the national economic development and the regional economic development. It was looked at that East Africa, particularly Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania were going to have an economic growth above 6%. While in the southern part, mostly South Africa, Eswatini, Malawi, Lesotho, Zambia, Zimbabwe, the economic growth was projected to be one to two percent. And when you come to the Western Africa, uh, East and West Africa were considered to have a very positive outlook. Uh, West Africa was probably having closer to the East Africa outlook, around four or five percent. Now, the challenge then that we are having, that with COVID-19, how does this affect the credit union system? If you look at the commodity prices who are affected before COVID-19, we talk about our, our members in Botswana who are linked to the credit unions in uh, the uh, Diamond Credit Union, our members in Nigeria, for instance, who are linked with the oil, that's Total Credit Union, with the lower pricing of commodity prices, by default, that affected our membership ability to engage, our members' ability to, to proactively save because of a couple of reasons, which I'll explain. Some of them are linked to COVID-19 uh, COVID after. Now, looking at these two, countries like Kenya and Tanzania, were considered to probably the fastest growing economies within this particular region. And in, in totality, uh, Kenya, T Tanzania, Angola, the projection has been pretty good. But when it comes to COVID-19 now, when you're looking at the COVID-19 currently, uh, the impact or the reaction, uh, what we are seeing is a little bit different. The reaction in the East and the Southern Africa may not necessarily be the same as the reaction in the Western Africa. In Western Africa, most of the countries have seen as much as you had the, the borders closed, there's less restriction in movement. If you go to Ghana, there's less restriction in movement. You come to Liberia, less restriction in movement within the country, and they don't have uh, uh, evening restrictions. Uh, it almost to them, things have been normal in that context. In the context of COVID-19 is a disruption. We've had worse things like this. Let's find ways of coping. You go to Gambia, also they've done the same. Now, when you look at the actual, the, the actual impacts, we look at the economic, I'll talk about unemployment rates. People have lost jobs. And Director Toto was clear on that. And this is across the continent. I'm seeing a lot of effect on this, particularly in countries like South Africa and Kenya that rely in, in service uh, sector. People have lost lots of jobs. The impact of that is the members are struggling to pay their financial obligations. Uh, the institutions are struggling to support uh, the credit union, in fact, to the extent that where I am today in Liberia, the, the teachers, the teachers uh, credit union are saying there's a struggle in terms of the employer meeting or making the payments.
to the credit union or even giving them the salaries. That alone has happened mainly because of COVID. The third one that we are seeing is there's high loan demand. There's high loan demand, perhaps because of our African culture whereby we live in an extended environment, there's the feel people need support. And it's, it's kind of puts us in an awkward position as credit union. Is this a time to lend? And if it's not, why is it that the commercial banks are able to lend and the credit unions will struggle to lend during this particular time? Or maybe it is just a time for us to rethink the manner in which we, we do our lending engagement with our membership. The last one, which, which is also huge, we've seen the low, the, uh, uh, low savings, uh, the pattern people probably prefer, they rather use the money that they have to support them in their day-to-day -day activities other than save. So the level of saving in a number of countries we are seeing that has gone down. Now, when you move to the next, the next thing, and what I say for me, uh, it help us reflect. It helps us reflect what is the main objective of a credit union in this particular challenge? Should we focus mainly on the business or should we focus on the social? It makes us think through. I know a number of initiatives have been done to support people during this particular time from paying PPEs. I know in Kenya, which the team will explain what, what has happened in Kenya, but I can point to, for instance, in Gambia, uh, the teachers circle, the police, uh, a total contributed close to 40,000 US dollars to support the movement in the country. I go to Ghana equivalent, just four or five credit union contributed close to 70,000 US dollars to support uh, the movement in terms of providing PPEs. Eswatini, the same, Malawi, even with the, with the nature that the economy is struggling, everybody feels the need to support the membership. For me, that shows the resilience and the, the, the money in which our leaders are saying and thinking, yes, we need to focus on the business. Yes, we are social entity, but our stability as a credit union depends on balancing the two. But let's think about it again. What opportunities then emerges from these challenges? I'm seeing a situation where we have a challenge, yes, but we, we also have an opportunity. Opportunity, Africa is the youngest continent, you may say, with a median average of 1918. And you can see the movement from 1974, you can see the way it's moving. Uh, the, the countries are moving in different levels. And the projection uh, by this, a continent of 1.3 billion people and uh, to, uh, by 2030, we are still an average of 22 years of age. So that means we are talking of a market for the credit union close to 500 million membership that we can penetrate it. Pe penetrate it. This is a young con continent. Maybe it is a reason why we might not be feeling the impact the way other continents are feeling. But this presents an opportunity for the credit union, a huge, huge opportunity. When you look at the reason why I'm saying so, uh, the, the next slide, which probably as a move on as opportunity that is before us, we've worked with different generations, Africa being the youngest continent, a median age of 18 as we speak, projected next five years, we'll still be 21, 22. We are talking about gen generation Z, generation Z, depending on how you pronounce that, their focus is on technology. It needs to help us as credit union rethink the money in which you operate. An opportunity to focus mainly on the safety and soundness of the credit union. The first point, is it an opportunity for us to start thinking about the, the circle business model? The circles that for perhaps might be surviving are uh, doing better today they have very good, good capital base. Their balance in regard to assets quality is it's quite visible. The ability to make surpluses is quite visible. They've been able to project. I know we talk about social and business and our impact within the community, 
but perhaps this pandemic provides us with an opportunity to rethink our business model. The second point, this pandemic provides us with an opportunity to actively engage with the regulators. When you look at the onion structure with the DEs are more familiar with, we, focus, we talk about the membership, we talk about the circles, we talk about the chapters, we talk about the national associations across the continent and coming into a COSCA. For us to succeed well from the suits, we say, let us as a national umbrella bodies engage with the regulators. In Liberia, for us to succeed, let us find a way of proactively engage with the regulator. Let us not wait for crises like this to start engaging with the regulators. We can constantly provide regulators with feedback on how the policies that are there are affecting them. The, 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 fourth, the fourth one, which is to me is the third one, which to me is key and linked with the generation dividend, which I was talking about, the young population, Let's rethink and work on digitalization and enhancing the share platform system within the credit union system. I applaud Republic of Gambia, for instance. They work in a system whereby despite them being small, they're able to operate in a manner that through the national structure, they have certain things that they will do together. If it's IT, they find a way of working together through one system. Maybe it is an opportunity for other credit unions across the continent. The ones that do not have, uh, are not as big as what we see in Kenya to start working in that particular uh, platform. But digitalization, I don't think there's any credit union that can survive without start focusing on digitalization. And lastly, for me, this provides us with a huge huge opportunity to adapt effective performance tools. Effective performance tool. The reason why we think effective performance tool is key uh, during any given point, once you have a tool that you're able to evaluate, we will have been able to tell that in this area, in Zambia, this, the amount of money that is being borrowed is used on, if it's agriculture, it's used on things that perhaps have faced a lot of difficulty during this particular time. If you had the appropriate tools and standard tools, which at times we, 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 we either do not do that, or we have things that resemble performance tools, but it is a high time that we work and adapt uh, a suitable performance tool for us. So in overall or in summary, while there's a challenge in the continent, while the pandemic has hit us hard, to us, we are looking at this as an opportunity for growth, an opportunity to serve our members, and an opportunity to rethink our circle business model. And lastly, this pandemic provides us with an opportunity to actually work on cooperation, the principle of cooperation among cooperatives. We might not be doing so well around this area. We might be competing more than cooperating more. This pandemic should help us think and move towards cooperation and constantly cooperating with each other across the continent and within the national uh, framework. Circles that are capable, you support the national association. The national association that are capable, you work with the COSCA. Oh, the work, COSCA, the reason why we're having this platform, because of our work with World Council, to help us as we work and spread the best practices that have been adapted globally. With that, thank you, Greg, for the opportunity. And of course, thank you, George. Um, you know, it's interesting to get that perspective on how this is impacting countries differently. Um, what we did have one question that came in, George, from Francis. He asked if you could answer this for him. How do SACOs deal with a liquidity crisis that is killing them as loan defaults continue to surge since loan restructuring is not a cure? 
Oh, that is that's a difficult a difficult question, and that's why I said for my for our side we we are looking at liquidity even before actually before COVID nineteen a number of circles were facing liquidity issues. The truth is some of them were even borrowing money to, money from commercial banks to pay dividends. So that already was a problem. So that should not be an issue. But in terms of solving, I will look at it in two ways. One is let us develop or work towards building a strong capital base. The second one, we find a way of engaging with uh, regulators, rules that perhaps might affect our ability to build capital base, our ability to, uh, to get involved, to see that there's good liquidity for the movement we need to address. And perhaps more education, because you discover that liquidity, at times the quality of asset that our credit union are having, there is a, there is more questionable. So again, it goes back, it's intertwined. It goes back on what has caused that liquidity challenge. There could be many other things that may not be related with COVID-19. That's my thinking. Very good, thanks so much, George. We did have a few other questions, but just in the interest of time, uh, we're going to move on here. We have a lot of speakers to get to. Um, and we're gonna turn next to get the perspective from a credit union level. Uh, George Ochiri is the CEO at Harambi Saco, one of the largest Sacos in Kenya. Dr. Ochiri became CEO at Harambi in 2019 after holding the same position with Safari Sako. He holds a doctorate in logistics and supply chain, manage supply chain management, and has stated that his goal is to make Harambi Sako worth 100 billion Kenyan shillings during his tenure there. Mr. Ochiri, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, to start us off, yes, uh, Rambe is the fourth largest, uh, currently standing at about uh, $31 million. And going straight to how circles have been affected, uh, let's move to the next. And uh, specifically, we first uh, recorded a case of COVID uh, in Kenya on 18th of March, and immediately lockdown measures were put in place. As uh, George Ototo put it, the economy was brought to a standstill and circles were adversely affected. And uh, the first is about uh, panic withdrawal, next. What we experienced is that uh, when, uh, let's go to the next, when this came up, uh, members, uh, members started withdrawing uh, their deposits. Let's go to the next. Uh, both uh, traditional savings and also withdrawable deposits. So there are long queues, uh, not only Tatarambe, but a number of circles, and this indeed affected cash flow. Uh, moving on, <clears throat> we also experienced uh, disruption in the calendar of circles in Kenya. Uh, circles normally close their financial years on 31st of December, like we're about to do so for 2020. Then we have a window of uh, four months during which we hold AGMs or general meetings a number of circles had not done the same. We are faced with a situation where we have board members who are due for rotation. They have not gone for rotation, that is re-election. And another year is also over. So next year, we are going to end up with boards, members who are due for rotation for accumulative two years. It is not yet clear how this will be handled. Then also we had an issue of distribution of surplus, which normally requires that the General Assembly gives approval for a number of circles by the time this came up, this had not been done. However, the Commission of Cooperatives uh, in Kenya gave guidelines on circles which had made surplus on how to distribute surplus and this was done. The other effect we experienced was that during the general assemblies or general meetings, we are supposed to appoint auditors. Now, since most circles did not do that, uh, it became very awkward and there is a solution. The Commission of Cooperatives in Kenya gave guidelines on uh, boards to uh, forward uh, names of proposed auditors uh, for confirmation. Uh, moving on, we also experienced panic borrowing. I think uh, one of the earlier speakers, this is particularly George Obado, already pointed out that there is a surge in borrowing. It is true there is a lot of pressure you find uh, one breadwinner 
in Kenya, supporting about 10 others. And with this condition, now the pressure to support more is um, more demanding. So there is indeed cash flow challenge as a result of uh, panic borrowing. And moving on still, we've experienced exits. So you find uh, the last resort for a member is to exit the circle. They withdraw their savings for survival, not for any particular investment. And this we have experienced at our circle, a number of circles. And indeed, we are fearing that this the circle family is shrinking in uh, Kenya. Moving on, we have also seen increased loan defaults, as correctly observed by George Obado. Uh, members have lost incomes, they are unable to pay. We've also experienced a case where employers are unable to remit deductions from members, so that circles are literally crippled in some subsectors, like was pointed out by George Ototo, like education. The circles are on their knees. Community based circles where businesses closed, they are unable to lend at the moment. Moving on, um, we had to respond in a, a small way because the situation is here with us. So most societies revised their budgets and strategies for the year 2020. In my case, we were to have a big celebration, 50 year jubilee. Uh, we had to drop this. We've also reduced uh, our turnover budget by 1 billion, that is about, um, uh, ten ten thousand dollars, and also expenditure has gone down as well. Uh, going on, we had to close uh, a number of service centers. We have a number of circles in Kenya with branches. Now, this did not go very well with our members who are used to uh, enjoying, let me call it banking, but it is actually circle services uh, in halls. Now, given the conditions and the social distancing requirement, um, we had to reduce this. Of course, they were not happy. Uh, we were forced even now to add tents so that for the few members who insisted on coming for services in the halls, we had to create more space. Uh, moving on, um, as I already pointed out, yeah, we've suspended the annual business plans, uh, not only at my circle, but a number of societies. So. Uh, training, capacity building among board members, among staff. For this year, very little has taken place, like was pointed out by the other speakers. And let's see more on. Um, we, there is also a blessing in uh, this situation. We have been able to move most of our loans services into mobile uh, platform. Uh, while I've given a breakdown of our specific case, in general terms, what we're pointing out is that we have been able to accelerate uh, intake of online learning. And this is a positive note, let's move on. We also noted that uh, <clears throat> for us to serve the members, we probably don't need to be or ask them to come to wherever we are. So we have started agency services. So we have recruited where we have units or concentration of our members, we have agents. So members are able to access their deposits, they are able to make payments. Now, not necessarily at our offices, but at agents. And this has been adopted by a number of societies in Kenya. Um, I know at least 10 of them. And this has eased the pressure for members to travel or to physically uh, come for services. Moving on again. Um, I was observing in our specific circle, yes, there is increased uptake of online services up to about 60%. A circle like Safaricom circle where I was, uh, services are online up to 100%. And the same is being adopted by a number of uh, other circles. On, um, yes, uh, there is anxiety as well among uh, staff and board members. Um, sorry to share with you, uh, in my circle, we've had four cases, affected staff. Good news, no fatality to date, but this brought a lot of strain among the staff. Um, you can be sure if this also was shouted to the members, then our halls would be empty. Then there would be a lot of panic. Let's move on. Uh, this is small statistics of how things are in Kenya today, uh, 85,000. 
with already 1,500 deaths and 56,000 recoveries. The world stage, we know very well, as shown on the right-hand side. Let's go back, to, let's move on to the next, uh, where we now move on. Other uh, services that we have changed is that um, we have deployed um, customer care team. Uh, if also, these are branches in the Kenyan context. Then uh, we are trying more to respond to members on their mobile calls. So we've implemented some integrated call center, which uh, makes it more uh, convenient to track whoever is looking for services. Then uh, a telecare center basically to take care of the many, many calls, which now becomes the main mode of service. Then uh, we've also upgraded the websites and put a number of uh, self-service uh, opportunities. Uh, agency have already pointed out. Uh, next, go to next. Then uh, in terms of making members aware of what is going on and marketing, uh, we are using uh, SMSs largely, then uh, sending them online. We've also developed e-shorts so that uh, members, we educate them despite the situation. We've also made uh, nice video clips, uh, some of them in the form of cartoon, so that we accelerate uptake of uh, online services. And generally, we've also seen increase in uh, usage of social media, especially when we're talking about new products and uh, events in the society. Still on, um, of course, uh, a number of societies have also still maintained the traditional of the billboards, like in our new agency service that I'm referring to, we make it known wherever we have a branch or uh, an agent. So when you are passing, you will see a nice logo of the society and then together with the services on offer. Uh, let's move on a bit. Then uh, this is very common today in Kenya, working uh, remotely from the office. Um, majority of the staff, we have pushed them to operate from home, except where necessary. Um, a number of circles, yes, have faced the challenge of cybercrime, but not to the extent we were fearing uh, ourselves. We have not been affected so much. We are lucky because of our size, we've been able to put in place uh, a cyber security system in which we have another third party <clears throat> overseeing our cyberspace. Then as we draw towards the close next, <clears throat> I think that is just about the stuff. We can just move on. Um, we, have also okay, we have also reduced the number of hours, especially when uh, there was complete lockdown. So instead of the eight hours, uh, we were doing about uh, six hours. Then uh, we've also operated on leave. We've asked staff mostly to go on leave so that if all goes bad, then we have a fallback of those who are not affected or those who are not on trace and can be called back to work. Uh, the buildings that we're using, of course, we are taking measures. It's mandatory now. We also provide staff with um, protective, uh, in a small way, masks and also sanitizers. And we check every person who is uh, coming for service in any of our branches. Uh, let's look at the next one. For update or to staff and members, thanks to technology, we have encouraged uh, WhatsApp groupings. So like um, we pass messages to staff and this is usually uh, instant about the progress, about a position of the society on the condition. And this I also share together with the members. Uh, we thank very, very much the developers of the technology platform that we are enjoying. Uh, this has worked well for us next. Let's just go next. Now, uh, there is, of course, uh, when we M circle, that is mobile circle service. Basically, I already pointed out that we pushed most of the products and services uh, to the mobile platform. The other one I wanted to point out is uh, on uh, board meetings. We have introduced, and a number of circles in Kenya have introduced uh, electronic board meetings. This has been accelerated very, very well uh, by the pandemic. Now, on our side, uh, just to be on top of things, uh, we've also enhanced our surveillance system and reconciliation. We've deployed, this is a software that is used well across the world. Idea software is an audit software. I think it came from somewhere in Canada. And this is working for us very well so that on a 24 hour basis, we actually have idea what is happening. 
together with business intelligence on our local uh, system that we are using, as much as the pandemic has made it difficult for physical contact, uh, we are able to move on. Uh, that's next. Next. Uh, I was pointing about governance and I was observing that, yes, the pandemic has brought another opportunity and we have saved very well. Instead of having board members travel to a boardroom, we have equipped them with gadgets. They are able to attend board meetings from wherever they are. The regulatory framework in Kenya allows and requires only the chairman and the CEO to be present at the headquarter of the society. The rest of the participants in any board meeting are allowed to attend from wherever they are online. Indeed, we've reduced our governance cost in a big way. As we move on, um, we are pointing out that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And as we close, my observation is that digitalization is the solution for the next future for SACOS in Kenya and across. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you, George. Uh, you know, it's interesting because both you and George Mbato mentioned the importance, kind of ended with the importance of digitalization of services. I just want everyone on the webinar to know that next Tuesday on December 8th, uh, we are going to be having a webinar on the on driving digital transformation during the COVID-19 era World Council is. It's going to be at 8 a.m. Uh, central time in the United States. So that'll be afternoon in Africa. But if anyone wants to join, you can go to our website, woku.org. There's a link, you can go right to the main page and you'll find a, a link to go register. So if anyone is interested in hearing more about the digital transformation of credit unions, again, that's next Tuesday, December 8th. Um, and just one note, housekeeping note, uh, a lot of people are using the raise your hand feature. We're not actually using that today just because of the number of attendees and panelists, but if you do have a question, you can, again, put it into the Q&A panel. So we appreciate that. Okay, uh, we're going to move on. George Ochiri, thank you so much for your presentation. We're going to move on now to our next speaker um, because SACOs aren't the only cooperatives in Kenya facing challenges due to COVID-19. So to give us a broader perspective on how cooperatives across the country are faring during the crisis, we are joined by Stephen Otieno. He is the Chief Operating Officer at the Cooperative Alliance of Kenya. He's also worked for the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA International, or NCBA CLUSA, as you may know it, and holds a master's degree in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial studies. Mr. Otieno. Thank you very much, Greg, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the entire team at WOKU for organizing very is very uh, worthy uh, webinar today. Uh, the pandemic, as has already been mentioned by the rest, has had far-reaching uh, effects in the lives of the people in various polities. And in Kenya, uh, we had the Cooperative Coronavirus Response Committee, which was set up by the um, State Department of Cooperatives through the commissioner uh, in March early this year. And uh, one of the, the membership of the CCRC is constituted by key stakeholders uh, in the cooperative sector in the country. This includes the State Department of Cooperatives itself, the Apex Body Cooperative Alliance of Kenya, the Cooperative Bank, Cooperative Insurance Company, uh, National Housing Co uh, Cooperative Union, as well as Cusco. The chairman of the fundraising committee, of course, or resource mobilization that has made us to achieve what we've done so far is uh, my brother, Jojo Toto, who spoke here earlier, and is also a member of the, uh, is a board member of WOC. The goal of CCRC was to attempt to raise 1 billion Kenya shillings to support cooperators who are affected, adversely affected by this pandemic as has already been mentioned by the other speakers. Uh, and here we were targeting to support about half a million households. The objectives of the CCRC one, again, was to monitor and review the development of the pandemic, working closely with the Ministry of, uh, of, of Health. 
Secondly, was to coordinate and mobilize resources, which of course was chaired by George, and then coordinate how we reach out and support uh, beneficiaries with the core kits. We were also to provide training and disseminate information to cooperative members, and also to give feedback to the cooperative sector on uh, the trends of the pan pandemic. We also supposed, we are not yet actually there yet, to develop a post COVID-19 pandemic coping mechanism, and also to commission a research on the effects of this pandemic to the cooperative sector. And finally, to measure uh, the effects continuously, me measure, monitor, and evaluate how the trends of the pandemic is actually uh, uh, taking us now. This was to be done We had Actually, nobody knew how long COVID will be with us here. So we had imagined that within six months, COVID would have been contained. So we had intended to actively operate for six months and then work on a post-COVID uh, you know, uh, situation. Nonetheless, the numbers are actually going up. Uh, incidentally, Kenya, we are just about 6,000 cases right now behind the number of cases that uh, are in China. So we probably need to rethink uh, on our strategy on how best to drive this course going forward in Kenya next. To help us move forward, we really had to see how do we utilize the local uh, infrastructure and human resource that is available within the cooperative uh, ecosystem in Kenya. So like I mentioned, we had three subcommittees. One was the resource mobilization subcommittee in which the marketing of this campaign was being led by Cusco. Accounting services are being provided by NCB Clusa. The second committee led by Professor Isaac Yamongo from the Cooperative University uh, is on information research and publicity. And the information and communication component of it is being supported by global communities, which is also another American uh, uh, NGO. Research is being led by the Cooperative University itself. Advocacy uh, is a, a function of Cusco and the Cooperative Alliance of Kenya. There's one bit that we've been contemplating on how best we can actually go around it, which I believe George uh, Ototo had mentioned also earlier, particularly on mental health, has been on psychosocial support. Then on monitoring and evaluation, that one is being uh, supported by NACHO. Then the last subcommittee is coordination and logistics. Next. Again, uh, like has been said by other speakers, uh, the effects of uh, this pandemic in the country, there are numerous job losses, closure of businesses, uh, members unable to service the obligations to circles, withdrawals. So I don't need really to repeat much on that. Many members have also uh, made abrupt withdrawals and uh, you know, exit from uh, societies. Afford affordable housing program, which was actually to be rolled out uh, uh, this year, has actually not been able to take off because of, uh, of this pandemic. Uh, Cusco has actually been championing very strongly on the release of about 27 million US dollars that is actually withheld by statutory deductions from employers uh, to uh, various cooperative societies. Then, of course, uh, George Ochiri has talked about postponement of the annual general elections and the implications of the same to the societies. Uh, if at all, we are going to have them next year. Next. How or what have we done to respond to COVID-19? Again, like I mentioned, actually it was 6th of April that the commissioner established the CCRC to work or see how best it can respond to the effects of this pandemic. Uh, and the approach that we've taken is basically hinged on what WHO advances on whole of society pandemic readiness approach so that every sector uh, needs to play some role towards ensuring that COVID-19 is managed within various subsectors, which also contributes or ultimately contributes to the entire nation states. Now, like I mentioned at the beginning, the COP kit was actually geared to 
support or reach out to about half a million beneficiaries. And uh, as at now, we are happy that we've been able to reach out to about 11,216, which is a very paltry percentage, about 1.9% of what we had targeted to reach out. But what we're happy about is that we've been able to touch the lives of about 44,864 persons from the 11,216 households. Another thing that is exciting is that we've been able to reach out to about 47% of uh, 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 women-led households. Next. The key achievements that uh, we're actually proud of is that despite the challenges that we are seeing during this period, we've been able to mobilize about uh, 9 million US dollars in a period of six months, which was our active period of fundraising. Uh, of course, it is way below our target, which was 118, uh, uh, 118. No, we've been able, our target was 9 million, but we've been able to raise 118,000 uh, in a period of six months, which is a good gesture because uh, everybody has been affected. The numbers uh, were not really adding up. And for people to actually go out, and I really thank societies such as Arambe uh, that also uh, supported this course. Uh, of course, the highest contributor in Kenya was the Kenya Police uh, Circle. Next. The limited response for appeal demonstrated that the project resource mobilization target of 9 million, of course, in six months was way beyond our uh, uh, the, uh, real, realistically uh, within uh, a range that could be achieved. But then we are happy, like I mentioned, we only achieved a part 1.17, but then the response and the effect that it has had, considering that we only received support from about 123 uh, cooperatives, but we benefited 653 cooperative societies. So 123 societies gave support to 653 cooperative societies. Next which is a clear demonstration of the seventh, the sixth principle of the cooperative movement on co cooperation among cooperatives. On information, research and publicity, of course, uh, the committee has been able to really ensure that uh, we get adequate exposure uh, in the media. And this has been in both electronic and the print media. Uh, we've actually appeared in, uh, in, in, in uh, as well as in, uh, uh, social media, we've been so much prominent uh, in those spaces, which is quite uh, uh, exciting. Next. Of course, I mentioned about our gender reach at 47% uh, of the entire number of uh, uh, beneficiaries reached so far, which is quite encouraging. And we encourage and continue to encourage anyone who's still willing to give a support to actually do so. Next. Of course, the challenges that we've faced, one of them George had already mentioned in, uh, uh, because of the restrictions that were there, people are not able to move. There was a lockdown, particularly of Nairobi. Uh, and even as we speak, there's still a curfew on. Uh, another challenge, of course, which I've mentioned earlier and has been alluded to by other speakers was on the uh, concern about loss of jobs and income. And then incomplete data is a big concern because one of the big problems you're having uh, in the cooperative sector, I think, and this actually cuts across the entire African continent, is incomplete data. Uh, we are not able to really determine the extent to which uh, this uh, pandemic has uh, uh, as, as, as uh, hit the sector, because there is no uh, linkage in terms of capturing data from the various subsectors of the cooperative movement, or even within the subsector itself, to be able to understand the, 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 the level at which uh, this pandemic has affected uh, uh, businesses. So it is something we need to work on. Uh, efforts are actually being made towards that. And I hope uh, sooner than later, and I believe through digitalization, uh, we are going to achieve this.
Our best practices that we're able to realize, one, we partnered with, some, uh, with two local supermarkets, which enabled us not to actually give the COP kits in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, real uh, items, but instead we're actually using a voucher system and they could actually walk into the supermarkets and be able to collect the various items which uh, we were providing them, which included maize flour, uh, five kilos of maize flour, a, key, a, a liter of oil, two kilos of uh, big, uh, uh, beans, uh, a bar soap, uh, masks, uh, um, and, and in some cases, green crops. Then we worked very closely with the government through the local uh, administrative uh, structures, which really helped us to make the whole exercise far much easier. And uh, we had a small portion of non-cooperators whom we also supported, and we used what in Kenya we call Nyumbakumi Initiative, in the Nyumbakumi initiative is people who live within an area covered by about 10 housing, uh, 10 houses are able to identify from amongst themselves who are the most vulnerable. Uh, and they would be able to identify them and pass their names through the administrative structure so that they can actually be able to support, to be supported. Of course, I've mentioned about using the vouchers through the society leaders. We were using a last mile approach in which we did not reach out to the, a particular cooperator as it were, or any other beneficiary uh, directly uh, as such. So we could, in the case of non-cooperators, we worked through the administrative structures of the government, but for the cooperators, we gave the vouchers to their cooperative societies to onward uh, distribute to the individual members whom they had identified. Uh, then we also partnered with like-minded uh, partners such as uh, NCBA CLUSA that has been very supportive to us in terms of providing accounting services. Uh, we also worked, uh, or rather are working with the global communities that has really help, uh, helped us in profiling the work that we're doing uh, in, in regards to publicity. Yes. And lastly, uh, this is one of the, uh, Cusco gave us a voucher of 1 million Kenya shillings. And here we have the chairman of the CCRC committee, as well as the principal secretary in the State Department of Cooperatives, receiving the support of Cusco from Cusco's advocacy manager and their business development uh, uh, manager uh, uh, here in Nairobi. So basically that is what we've been able to do uh, in as far as responding to COVID-19. The other thing that we are about to uh, do right now is uh, uh, to commission a study which will be led by the Cooperative University of Kenya. It's one of the activities that is pending. Uh, we are also in the process of trying to think through how best we can roll out the element of psychosocial support to address mental illness amongst uh, members of uh, the cooperative movement in Kenya. Thank you. All right, Steve, thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's interesting to get that perspective on how the cooperatives are all working together towards COVID-19 response. And, and we really appreciate you joining us today and offering that. Um, we did have one question come in and, and George Mbato, if you're uh, available, I thought you might be best to answer this. Um, uh, question from B, Judith Tabufor, who asks, how can credit unions benefit through WOKU and Akoska policy in managing money laundering and the financing of terrorism. George Mbato, if you're there and want to want to take that one. Yeah, th th thank you, Greg. I'll probably respond to Judith from uh, Cameroon that one of the things that uh, uh, I think, I believe with World Council and the committee that we are having for COVID, uh, there's intention, and I know Dr. Brand Branch is with us here, there's intention to develop a white paper that will address some of these things. So with, with time, we'll be able to provide a, a comprehensive document that will support us in various things, not just money laundering alone. The second thing, Akoska has been working with World Council to the regulatory framework, uh, the regulators round table, and uh, we are trying to develop strategies that we can use in terms of supporting our advocacy. And with the regulators, we opted uh, last year that we should also be thinking about how we can address the issue of money laundering. 
So with World Council expertise globally, uh, we are going to use that to contextualize it within the continent. I hope I've answered, Judy. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, George. Uh, really appreciate your response to that. And, 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 and we did have a webinar a couple of weeks ago on anti-money laundering and counter financing of terrorism and how that has changed and what we're seeing in terms of trends. And that's also on the YouTube channel, on the World Council YouTube channel at youtube.com slash W-O-C-C-U. Uh, we're gonna turn now to Malawi. The Malawi Union of Savings and Credit Cooperatives is also one of World Council's direct member organizations in Africa. And we're now joined by their CEO, Fumbani Nyangulu, who has been with the organization since 2008. He's going to talk about how credit unions there are responding to the crisis. Fumbani? Thank you so much, uh, Greg. Um, quite a uh, uh, good conversation, and uh, we're delighted uh, uh, to share what is uh, happening in Malawi. Uh, especially under the topic uh, of COVID, how our credit unions have been uh, affected, uh, the response, and uh, also what could be the way forward uh, in terms of uh, what, the, the, what the movement is thinking here in Malawi. So we can go next. All right, so we'll be discussing uh, the current status of the pandemic, and uh, we also look at the impact. Basically, we want to take you to, uh, to, the, uh, to the impact to the whole economy. Uh, uh, looking at uh, Malawi being a smaller economy, we will see during, uh, in the presentation, and we can also see being a smaller economy how the, uh, the circles are being affected uh, uh, to that level. And uh, then the interventions also by the stakeholders and this include the government as well as uh, the regulator. Yes, and we'll look at the outcome. Yes, we can move. Right, so currently, uh, this is data for some two days ago. Uh, published by the Minister of uh, Health. And uh, in Malawi, um, the cases that uh, have been uh, reported, uh, the total is uh, 6,040. And uh, we can see that uh, the total recovered being 5,471. And the total dates have been uh, 185 can see that the numbers compared to so many other countries uh, in Malawi, as much as we've been hit, but uh, in a, uh, comparatively, we can say that uh, we've been a bit lucky here, um, that the impact, I mean, the, uh, the number of uh, uh, dates, the affected cases, I mean, the cases have been uh, not that uh, huge. But you can also attribute this to a number of challenges, uh, one of it being uh, maybe the level of testing here in Africa and uh, Malawi inclusive. You can see that uh, maybe those that have been uh, tested are just uh, below 100,000. Um, um, I mean, uh, that uh, can also uh, bring in another uh, dimension. Maybe we do not know the number, the total numbers of people affected. Yes, we can go next. Right, so you can see uh, why I'm bringing uh, the issue of the economy is uh, so that we can uh, fully understand uh, the environment our circles are operating in, being a very, very small economy of 4.7 uh, billion US dollars, uh, projected to grow to around 6, uh, uh, 6 billion by 2021 and uh, 7.5. By 2022. And this is basically an agro based uh, economy uh, with uh, possibly uh, less contribution from the other industries. And that means uh, anything happening to this kind of uh, sector, the agricultural sector, normally has devastating effects uh, onto the economy and uh, obviously uh, to the financial sector. And uh, the main uh, export trading countries in the, uh, for Malawi being South Africa, USA, Europe, and of course, uh, uh, 
a little bit uh, in the neighboring countries. And why I mentioned those countries, uh, those are countries that have uh, been affected heavily and uh, therefore a huge impact on the trade uh, side uh, of the economy. Yes, we can move. Right. You see in the graph below, you find that uh, when COVID was announced uh, uh, in March uh, 2020, to date, we see that uh, the most affected uh, uh, sector has been that of uh, the services, and especially the tourism sector and uh, the, uh, in, uh, whose uh, possibly performance declined by uh, 20%. And uh, that is so huge. And um, I, I repeat, look at that relative to the size of the economy. You look at the industry also, uh, the Malawi continues to rely on uh, agricultural um, uh, sales, especially in the tobacco area. Um, of course, it is declining uh, due to uh, a number of lobbies uh, surrounding tobacco, and uh, now people are looking at other sales, but still commands uh, the biggest uh, export earner for the country, and the reduction in that area has been 13.5%. The wholesale and retail uh, trading reduced by 10% and the agricultural sector by 5%. Now, you look at all that kind of reduction in a smaller economy, you find that the poorest uh, people, they have lost income to about 12.6% uh, and possibly the rich have reduced by 17.7%. And that has pushed the national poverty rate to about 8.4% with about 1.5 million people falling into uh, the poverty category. And that is a huge uh, impact uh, uh, when you look at the credit unions, those, uh, those that are operating in the uh, rural, rural areas, uh, the countryside of the country. Uh, that is huge, huge uh, impact. And then uh, the national DP, GDP decreased by 8.2%. And uh, again, uh, that speaks to uh, uh, the uh, the performance uh, of uh, uh, the economy in that case. Let's move. Yeah, so that is uh, the uh, the graphical presentation uh, showing how the tourism has declined uh, way down. This closing of schools also uh, by way of. Uh, um, uh, measures uh, to uh, to prevent the spread of uh, the, co the, the the coronavirus. The, these are some of the government interventions, just like my colleagues have mentioned in Kenya, uh, where we share quite a number of uh, issues. Uh, happen uh, the issues happening in Kenya is almost the same happening here. Uh, the only difference possibly is uh, the economy, as I've mentioned. So quite a number of issues that have been uh, mentioned by my colleagues are not repeat. It is almost the same. Schools being closed and uh, the impact being 12.7 percent and uh, uh, the banning of exports, the uh, no international travels, uh, all that contributed almost to another 10 percent uh, decline to the economy. Governments uh, impose some mean lockdown. Here we were not closed completely. Uh, it was just restrictions uh, on trade, tourism, the markets being closed. Uh, uh, we didn't have a curfew like uh, my colleagues in Kenya. Um, in this country, things continued, but uh, at a very, very restricted uh, pace. Uh, local travel restricted, airports closed. Uh, of course, uh, implementing the social distancing, sanitization, just like uh, or other countries have been doing. So trade is still continued, but at a very, very uh, reduced pace. Uh, exports also at a very, very uh, reduced uh, pace uh, due to the uh, closure of uh, airports and the like. So generally business slowed down by almost 30% according to the uh, economies uh, as at uh, December. 
In September, we saw some restrictions uh, being lifted and uh, business started growing. And the growth is, uh, project, uh, is estimated to be at around 5% per month. Of course, except the tourism sector that continues to suffer uh, the business falls because uh, all these uh, tourism areas People have still not started coming in uh, uh, because the pandemic is still there. Although some restrictions have been lifted, but I think the tourism is still uh, affected heavily. Yes, we can move. Now, uh, the, the regulator also responded uh, uh, to, the, uh, to this and uh, uh, my colleagues have also mentioned, the regulator came into the sector, the entire financial sector, and uh, for the, to the banks, I think the main uh, intervention was the reduction of the liquidity reserve requirement, the RRR, which was reduced from 10% to about 4% just to allow liquidity into the sector so, uh, to expand the loanable uh, fa uh, funds uh, to people so that they could uh, cope uh, with uh, the effects of the virus. So this, this was a major uh, intervention to the sector. And uh, also they came in to, imp to, imp uh, to, imp uh, to ask uh, the financial sector players to implement a moratorium on loans. Um, uh, uh, this caused uh, a bit of destabilization in the sector. Uh, the microfinance institutions, the circles, the banks. Uh, but later on, it was uh, clarified, and then uh, a little bit, everybody um, implemented the moratorium on case-by-case -case basis. So it was not a 100% moratorium, but on case-by-case -case basis. They lifted some regulatory requirements on uh, credit classification to do with uh, delinquency and uh, uh, liquidity, and they also relax some uh, administrative measures on non-compliance on standards. This also helped quite a lot because uh, uh, just as we'll be seeing, the real impact uh, to circles uh, in this period has been uh, the delinquency, which has been increasing. So the regulator came in to relax a bit in terms of uh, uh, enforcement of some of these administrative measures. They also came to the, uh, to the mobile net network operators, the MNOs, uh, because during this period, I think uh, there's uh, been an increase in uh, uh, financial transactions on the phone, and uh, the financial sector lobbied with the regulator to make sure that uh, the fees are reduced and uh, uh, just to allow uh, more services uh, to pass to the phone uh, because access to some of the banking calls has been a, a challenge because some of the banks closing the, the branches, uh, similar to circle, uh, I mean, uh, microfinance institutions. So that uh, prov uh, provided some relief and uh, a lot more transactions uh, taking place on the phone. They also opened the window for more loanable funds to the financial sector and at last conditions. And this was just basically to, uh, to help increase liquidity into the uh, financial system. Yes, we can move. Now, nothing really different uh, from uh, what has already been uh, presented. I think it has been the same to our circles in Malawi. Um, on average, uh, delinquency increasing uh, by, uh, by 3%, but liquidity reduced at a higher level, uh, 20%, basically because uh, of high lo uh, loan demands, as well as a high um, uh, with, uh, withdrawal deposits also increased and the demand in this area was also very, very high impinging greatly on the liquidity uh, of circles. There has been reduced uh, profitability because uh, if the delinquency is increasing, the cost also increasing uh, in this time around uh, to do with uh, 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 expenses to do with uh, 
uh, with sanitization and also trying to uh, to be relevant in the communities by uh, provision of the PPEs uh, to communities, uh, also getting so much onto internet and the internet uh, costs uh, rising. Generally, the, the, we, we experienced increase in expenses uh, maybe by almost 18%. Our membership uh, growth reduced by almost 10%. And all in all, we find uh, we've seen, uh, we've experienced uh, reduced growth in the entire uh, circle uh, sector. Then uh, productivity reduced, just like uh, also uh, happening in Kenya that uh, people will be working from home. And uh, it, this has really uh, reduced uh, staff productivity. The services also to our members, considering that uh, not all circles are automated, maybe uh, just 50% or 60% of the circles are automated, meaning that uh, uh, a great number of circles still operating manually or they are semi-automated and they, they cannot get to the level of digitalization that is required so that we are providing uh, convenient services to our members. And uh, it means that members have to go to the banking halls. And if the banking halls are not accessible, our member services uh, efficiency has been greatly affected. And there has been reduced also community engagement because we have a number of uh, circles in the rural area. And uh, if with the mobility challenges, community engagement has been an issue. Impact on, on circles on a positive note. Yes, um, the realization that uh, circles now we need to cooperate more. And uh, our main area here where circles are now saying we need to go is uh, digitalization making sure that uh, all the circles are automated and then they move to digitalization uh, so that such uh, pandemics coming, uh, we should be able to continue servicing our members uh, just like uh, any other country they do it. We also considering now uh, of uh, investing in uh, shared services, uh, knowing that some, some are small circles they should be able to uh, take advantage of uh, the services, uh, of course, uh, relying on the principle of cooperation among us uh, cooperatives. So this is another area that we believe uh, the, the, the opportunity uh, that has been uh, brought by COVID. We're also seeing building of a liquidity fund. Yes, we have a central finance facility, but maybe there has been a great realization of capitalizing it uh, heavily so that in such kind of uh, pandemics, uh, circles are easily uh, able to access uh, uh, funds uh, from the central finance facility, more or less like growing the central finance facility fund. And also this uh, great discussion on the uh, uh, working on the stabilization fund and deposit guarantee, all these are projects that started some time back but I think the pandemic has shown us that uh, we really need to think about this so seriously, uh, stabilization fund to support those small, small circles that could be collapsing and uh, maybe probably providing them with uh, long-term kind of uh, support. And the deposit guarantee, if a circle collapses, uh, should our members lose completely? I think this is another key uh, issue. Building of strong capital base in the system I think this, as George also mentioned, this is another area where the circles will be investing more. Responsive products development, when such kind of pandemics uh, take place, um, uh, what products are we coming up with? We could see some of uh, the circles coming up with the COVID related uh, products basically to support their members. We saw that some of the circles really uh, practiced um, or implemented uh, the mandate of uh, the circle system, uh, looking at members first, possibly profitability later. Yes, we can move. All right, so by closing, I think I can say that uh, 
uh, much as uh, the, kind, the economy has been uh, hit in a number of sectors, what we saw is uh, unless uh, maybe a circle is drawing the members from an institution that has uh, 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 retrenched members, but I think on average we could see that uh, the the uh, the effect on the circles has not been as uh, it is being reported in various countries. I think in our case we've been able to stay afloat, and we still want to maintain that and even increase in terms of uh, resilience. Thank you so much. All right, Fumbani, thank you so much. An uh, interesting presentation there. And it, again, interesting to see how this is affecting credit unions in different countries and SACAs in different countries differently. Um, I know there are a number of questions in the Q&A panel. We're going to save those to the end because we want to get to our next speaker. So if you can hang on to the end, we'll ask some of those of our credit union and SACO uh, uh, participants here. But we're going to go finally. We're thrilled to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth Gummerson. She is the Executive Director of Performance Management for Action at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Gummerson provides technical and operational leadership for the PMA project. Prior to joining PMA, she worked on implementing household surveys in Africa for over a decade in partnership with US and African universities. She received her PhD in demography and a master's in public affairs, both from Princeton University. Her research work focuses on economic inequality and socioeconomic factors that determine access to healthcare. She's giving a presentation today based on her recent report entitled The Dire Impact, The Dire Economic Impact of COVID-19 in Africa. Dr. Gummerson, thanks for being here. We're so thrilled to have you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is a very unusual audience for me. I usually speak to academic audiences of statisticians and demographers and epidemiologists. So I'm really excited to be to be here with you today um, and talk to you a little bit about the evidence that we've gathered um, on the economic impact of COVID. And, uh, you know, I know that in a prior version of this webinar, you had a, a someone speaking about kind of the modeled effects of COVID on the global economy. And I've just heard several of um, these your presentations on sort of the effects on SACOs and the effects on the financial sector. And so what I actually have to talk to you about today is some data that we collected uh, on the effects on individual households. So it's kind of zooming down to, to your members and your constituencies, what's going on at the household level um, <clears throat> in about 11,000 households in Africa. <coughs> Excuse me. So the starting just by giving you a little bit of information on the PMA project so you can understand uh, sort of where we got our data from. This came about in the context of a larger project, uh, the Performance Monitoring for Action project. And uh, it's based at Hopkins University um, but, and it's funded by the Gates Foundation, but we actually partner with uh, Jepaigo and uh, university uh, and research partners throughout our eight countries, uh, seven countries in Africa and one in India to do a household survey of women. And it's under normal circumstances, our survey is a health survey, a reproductive health survey. And so we go to a representative survey, uh, sorry, a representative sample of women in their households in these countries and geographies um, and ask them a series of questions about their health and their reproductive health. Um, but we also, because health is so tightly linked to wealth, you know, wealthier households and wealthier people tend to be healthier. Um, we also ask some economic questions. Um, and I, I said that we had a representative household survey of women. And I think that's pretty key for this COVID work and for what I'm about to talk about, because that means that we make sure that the women in our sample match the profile of the women in the country. So if 5% of the country is between the ages of 30 and 32, then 5% of our sample will be too. And that's the same with marital status, wealth, family size, et cetera. And that's important. Oh, sorry, let's go back. <laughs> that's important um, because we get a much more accurate snapshot of what's going on in the surveys. Um, usually surveys only, you know, that survey people via SMS or only reach urban populations. They miss a part of the picture, namely, you know, anyone who doesn't have an SMS credit that day or anyone who lives in a rural area. And very often the part of the picture that they miss are the poorer and more marginalized communities that are harder to reach. And so we actually um, go to, to great lengths to get the, those, uh, those communities as well. 
and so that we have sort of a full snapshot of the of the country or of the geography in which we're working on. And from 2013 to 2018, we did that with a fresh sample every year. But in starting in 2019, we changed the design. And now we're going to go back to the same women every year. And so uh, at the end of 2019, we started with our standard health survey of women. And we went to all of their households and asked them um, you know, our, our standard survey. And then about halfway through, when we had finished four of our eight countries in March of 2020, COVID hit. And so we had to pull all of our teams out of the field for health reasons. You can't be sending people around when there's a pandemic. Um, and that was a disappointment for us, but it was also a real opportunity because we realized that we have a representative sample of women for whom we already had data on what their households looked like before the, the COVID pandemic hit. And we had their phone numbers and the ability to reconnect them. And if you recall at the time, there was very little information on COVID in low and medium income countries. And actually there's still not a great deal of information, although it's been nice to see some of, um, some of the data actually presented today in, the, in these talks. Um, and the information that was coming out was generally not terribly representative. So we thought we could do a better job. Um, and so we recontacted our entire sample about six months later um, from the first time that we had contacted them. And that was depending on the four countries that we were in. And I'm gonna present data from Nigeria, uh, the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Burkina Faso, and Kenya. Those were the four countries where we had completed our first round of data collection before the COVID uh, hit. And uh, <coughs> because we'd already collected all the data in those countries, we knew what the households looked like beforehand. Um, and we knew we would be able to get a better picture of the impact of COVID in those households. Um, we asked, I have the list of the topics that we covered there. I'm not going to read them because you can read them, but we, I'm just going to focus on the socioeconomic consequences of COVID-19. And so these, sorry, go back. <laughs> Prior slide, thank you. So the questions that uh, this research was focused on was whether COVID would exacerbate uh, health and income inequality. So if you can set your mind back to the spring of this year, there was not much hard data available on any of the impacts, um, either economic or otherwise. Everyone felt that the impacts were gonna be huge and there were lots of models, I think like the ones that you saw pre prior, which um, showed huge impacts. Um, and what little data was available mostly came from the global north where the pandemic had taken hold and restrictions were in place. And it suggested that even at that stage, there were beginning to be winners and losers in terms of the economic impact and the health consequences as well. So women, minorities, people in the informal sector and service jobs were bearing disproportionately both the economic and the health impacts. And so that has the potential to have knock-on consequences on inequality that far outlast the length of the pandemic. So that was really our overarching question and what we're looking at, um, sort of the overall hit, but particularly inequality, who, who's taking most of the economic um, burden of this. And because the PMA panel is going for at least three years, we should actually be able to follow these households over several years and see them kind of before, during, and hopefully after the pandemic and see how it plays out out of the time. But the results that I have today are just from the first round. Um, and they're really focused on sort of the short-term economic impact. So this are sort of four to eight weeks into the restrictions, um, what's happening in the households, how are things looking? And I'm actually only going to talk about the first three of those subpoints today because we just don't have that much time. But if people are curious about the other ones, I can perhaps talk more about them in the question and answer. OK, next slide, please. So. Um, I'm gonna talk about two economic indicators that we measured at the household level, household income loss, which we define by whether the household had experienced no income loss, partial income loss, or complete income loss since the beginning of the COVID restrictions. And then the other indicator that we're gonna talk about is food security. And so there's lots of ways to define food security in the academic literature. Um, we talk about mild food insecurity where people are concerned about losing, not being able to feed themselves and they have to make hard trade-offs in order to keep food on the table. We talk about sort of moderate food insecurity, which is people might be skipping meals, but they're, they're getting something in the day. And then we talk about severe food insecurity, which means that people are, are going you know, 24 hours without eating anything at all. And so we're actually only measuring the most severe version 
question of food insecurity in, in our survey, which is households where at least one of the adults has gone 24 hours without eating anything because there just wasn't access to food. And then we look at a bunch of characteristics of our, of our respondents and how those relate to the risk that you're gonna be food insecure or that you're going to lose income at, the, at your household level. Um, so we don't look at gender because all of our uh, respondents are women, um, but they're describing their households. But we look at marital status, age, parity, which means how many children you have, education, employment, uh, the size of your household, the how wealthy your household was before, whether you live in an urban or rural area. Um, we also looked at some of the sort of characteristics and the relative wealth um, and, and financial connectedness of your community to see if that had protective effects. Next slide. So this is a busy slide. It has a lot going on, um, so bear with me. But what you're looking at is the percentage of women in each wealth category. And we divided, for each of our um, geographies, we divided the entire population into three categories, sort of the least wealthy 30%, the middle 33% and the wealthiest 33%. So we lined up everybody in the population by their relative household wealth and split it into sort of low, medium and high wealth. Um, and you can do that you know, using three categories or five categories or 10 categories. It's, it's sort of um, similar, but we use three. And then we looked at in each of these wealth categories who reported no income loss, partial income loss or complete income loss. Um, and so sorry for those, if it's hard to read, the, the farthest left hand is the lowest uh, in each of the um, sections. The farthest left hand is the lowest wealth category before the COVID, and the farthest right hand is the highest wealth category before COVID. And the light blue is uh, the percentage of women who reported that their household lost all of its income. The medium is some of its income, and then the dark blue is the percentage of women who reported that their household didn't lose any income at all since the start of the COVID restrictions. So the biggest surprise to me was just the extent of income loss. And I think some of the prior speakers have also uh, observed this through their work with SACOs. Uh, it, it, you know, that those blue, dark blue parts are really, really small. So in Burkina Faso, which I think had the least income loss, still nearly 75% of women reported partial or complete household income loss. Remember, that's a nationally representative sample. Um, and then in our other geographies, it was more than 90% of women lost at least part of their household income. Um, and then, you know, the complete and total of all your household income loss was between 16% in Burkina Faso and 62% overall in, in Kinshasa in the DRC. So um, I, I think that was surprising, just kind of the depth and, and perhaps not to the, the people on this call based on what I've seen in the, in the discussions already. Um, but to me, the, the depth of the household income loss and, and how widespread it was, was surprising. The other big surprise is that this looks a little bit different than the patterns that, <coughs> excuse me, we saw in the global north. So if you look at Lagos, Nigeria, on the um, right hand side, you'll see a kind of stepwise pattern in the light blue. So people in the lowest income, uh, tertile income category are most likely, most of them, 40%, 43% uh, have lost, completely lost their household income. And in the medium, it's slightly lower and in the high, it's just slightly higher. So that pattern, that sort of stepwise pattern where poorer households are more, experience a more severe economic hit um, is what I expected and what we expected to see everywhere. Um, that's pretty much what we've seen in, in the global north, but actually in three out of four of our, um, three out of four of our countries, that's actually really not the case. Like there isn't a really strong pattern. Uh, <clears throat> so this is an economic shock that's actually impacting people across the board. You know, high income households, low income households, medium income households, for the most part, it's not, uh, it's not sort of unequally distributed, the loss of household income. Next slide, please. However, the uh, moving from the income loss to sort of the most severe consequences of income loss, which is hunger, uh, 
And that is uh, distributed along what we call a gradient, meaning that the poorer you are, the worse it is for you. Um, <clears throat> but even so, um, I, I, again, I do think the overall levels are somewhat shocking. Um, you know, the, the lowest level of food insecurity was 17% of households. And remember that this is severe food insecurity. So 17% of the households are reporting that somebody in the house didn't eat for 24 hours a day in Burkina Faso. That's actually pretty similar to the numbers coming out of the United States at the same time. Um, and that's the best number, right? And that's for severe food insecurity. Uh, in Kinshasa, in the DRC, uh, it was about 40% of women reported that at least one member of their household had gone without eating um, for the whole day. In Kenya, it was about 30, around 30% 30 for the whole country. Um, and that's as, you know, out eating, hadn't eaten, sorry, had gone hungry since the beginning of the COVID restrictions. So it's sort of between four and six weeks, um, sometime in the last four to six weeks. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I think the message here is that everyone is taking an economic hit sort of across the socioeconomic spectrum, but the poorer households are pushed into severe food insecurity at much higher levels. Although to me, I think it's also surprising, it's not negligible even in the wealthier households, right? You see 32% of the wealthiest households in Kinshasa repeat reporting uh, food insecurity. So um, I think, that's kind of surprising. And so I think that's, it's a very real and a, and a slightly scary impact. So even in places where the actual infection rates are not necessarily all that high and, you know, all the caveats about imperfect knowledge of infection rates, I think, you know, the governments in most of these geographies moved pretty quickly and decisively to contain the virus. And, you know, I work in health and so we cheer that. And we have some other data showing not just that the governments put uh, restrictions in place, but also people themselves really had high levels of adherence to social distancing and protective behaviors, much higher than we see here in the United States, for example. And so I think it's, it's an epidemiological success story that maybe doesn't get enough press. Like there's actually done a pretty good job of controlling COVID-19 but there are still real economic impacts um, and there are real health impacts. Even if you're not getting COVID-19, going hungry isn't good for your health either. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the next slides I'm gonna show you go into a little bit who is most at risk um, beyond just kind of the poorest households. So this is a complicated slide, um, but it's talking about the individual characteristics and what characteristics put you at risk of being in a household that loses its income completely. So the characteristics are li um, listed on the left-hand side there. And the thing to pay attention to, to read this graph, and these are the estimates, and I should sorry say that there's a, a a grouping of three. So we did the estimate for the total sample and then we also split the sample into urban and rural to see if the impacts were different in urban and rural communities. So the dark blue is the total sample, the orange is the urban sample, and the purple is the rural sample. And for the most part they move together so you can kind of look at the three as, as a group. <clears throat> so if you look at that dotted line that goes straight up and down, that's kind of the key to reading this. So the dotted line that goes straight up and down, if your estimate and the estimates are those side to side lines with the dots in the middle, the dot in the middle is the point estimate, the, the, the length of the line is the confidence interval. So, so we're sort of, this is the estimate that we actually measured and the length of the line is we're 95% confident that the, the real estimate is somewhere in that line. So the way to read it is if that line crosses the dotted up and down line, there's no difference in risk based on that characteristic. So for that first characteristic, which is marital status, not being married, you know, you see all of those three uh, blue, orange, and purple lines cross that dotted line. So there's really no difference in risk of losing your household income, whether you're married or not. But if you go down to the next uh, level, <clears throat> which is parity, which is how many children a woman has, compared to women who don't have children, you know, that whole line is on the right-hand side. So women who have children, are at higher risk of losing their income than women who don't have children. And then if women who have two to three children are even four plus, you can see the lines start moving even further off to the right. So the more children you have, the more, the higher the probability that you've lost your household income. Um, and then 
similarly or relatedly, if the lines are all on the left hand side of the dotted line, then you actually have a lower probability of having lost your household income. So this is similar to the, the, the um, graph that I showed you previously. Most of these lines cross the dotted line, um, which is to say the same thing that I said before, which is that for the most part, people across the socioeconomic spectrum and people of all characteristics are experiencing this economic shock. It's not just poor people. It's not just people um, who are in the workforce or out of the workforce or have you know, higher education or lower education. For the most part, everybody's experiencing this economic shock. There are two things that stand out. One is for some reason, and I don't have a great answer to this, women with children are more likely to lose <coughs> all of their household income and that's independent of whether the children live with them in the household. Um, they don't actually have to have the children with them in the household to be more likely to lose their household income. And the other one, if you look all the way down, um, it's to the number of members in the household. People in larger households are less likely to have lost all of their household income. And that kind of makes sense if you think that, you know, the more adults are in the household, the more likely somebody is still earning something. Next slide. So this is the same kind of picture, only now we're talking about the characteristics associated with food insecurity instead of the characteristics associated uh, with household income loss. And in this one, we actually do see um, more of what I describe as uh, commonly referred to as a socioeconomic gradient. So again, children who are at higher risk of living in food insecure households, um, sorry, women with children, are at higher risk of living in food insecure households. And you can extrapolate from that that children themselves are more uh, likely to live in households that are food insecure. Uh, it's the same finding, by the way, here in the United States around the same time. If you look down um, at <clears throat> the next category down, which is age, older uh, women are less likely to be in food insecure households than younger women. And people with, uh, post-primary or tertiary education are less likely to be food insecure than women who don't have, who just have a primary education or don't have any education. So that's probably not surprising to, to people on this call. Um, and then we saw that the being in the highest income category is protective uh, and it's protect and being even being in the middle income category is protective overall and it's protective in urban areas. But interestingly, being in the middle income category isn't protective in rural areas for food insecurity. Um, and then that final category, work status, we, it's listed as cash um, and cash in kind not paid. And what that actually means is um, people who are participating in the formal sector and people who are participating in the informal sector. And <clears throat> those compared to people who are not working at all, what is their risk of being food insecure? And so I think it's surprising that um, women who are working in the formal sector are not at any less risk of being food insecure than people who are not, women who are not working at all. Um, there's, and also similarly in the informal sector, there doesn't seem to be a statistically significant risk, although for the rural uh, area, it's almost, um, it's almost across that dotted line. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, household size is not protective as it is with income laws, and that kind of makes sense. So next slide, please. So I think, you know, the key take homes from this are that households across the socioeconomic spectrum suffered substantial income loss during that initial period. And that is actually different than uh, the United States and, and certainly from the data I've seen from the US census and the sort of the global north in general where the wealthiest households were much more protected. That's not the case in these African settings that we've looked at. Uh, food insecurity is very widespread. Even households with high levels of wealth experience food insecurity. But poor households, of course, are at a greater risk of food insecurity. Uh, women with children have a higher probability of being food insecure, as well as women with low education and low household wealth before the COVID, uh, COVID pandemic hit. So I think those are the big take-homes about 
what's happening. I think the overall take home is just the depth of the economic effect on households. And also that, you know, there are some that are more affected than others. There are characteristics that are associated with more extreme, uh, more severe effects than others, even though the, the hit is felt across um, the socioeconomic spectrum. And then I would just say that, you know, we are actually currently following up with these households six months later to see what's happening in the long term. There may be households that are more resilient, um, who bounce back quickly, and there may be households for, whim, for whom these effects last much longer, um, and we're, we're talking to them now. So we should have that data in the next month or two. Next slide, please. So the other thing I wanted to say, I think a couple of the speakers uh, before me, uh, Mr. Otieno, I think mentioned that there, there isn't a great deal of data in all of these sectors. So here's some data that's freely available. Um, it's not you know, data on SACOs, but it is data on uh, your members. Uh, it's at pmadata.org. There are dashboards that are sort of easy to manipulate. You can change the graphs that I just showed you um, according to something other than wealth if you wanted to look at age distribution or um, education distribution. There's lots of data on there that you can look at and manipulate for if you are interested in it. And then actually the raw data, if you have people in your organizations that like to crunch data and work with statistics, the raw data is going to be available uh, for free for download in January for all of these countries. So stay tuned for that. And that's the sort of highlights I had for you. Um, thanks very much for listening. Thanks so much, Dr. Gummerson. You know, it's interesting that, you know, those four countries, there was, uh, the, it seemed like the depth of the, of the impacts was different, but it, can you give any, have, I know you touched on this a bit, but can you glean anything on why it's differed so much in Africa compared to the US or the global north, like Europe, as you put it, in regards to the higher income families also experiencing losses? Is that something you're still trying to figure out? I think, wow, well, I'm so I'm an academic, so I'm very, we never say anything <laughs> without evidence. <laughs> like it makes us very uncomfortable to speculate. Um, I think we are still trying to figure out, figure that out. Um, you know, and be, to be honest, in this conversation, one of the things I'm thinking about is, is access to, to banking and, and financial systems and formal and informal financial systems. Um, so during listening to all of this conversation, I've been thinking we actually do have, have measures of people's access to, to finance and access to banking and formal banking. Um, we do know whether the women that we're talking to have accounts and what kind of accounts they have. And so that's something I'm actually you know, when we looked at it in aggregate, it didn't have much of a risk profile. Um, but I think uh, looking at the, the type of access and thinking about SACOs and how they help, I'm gonna go back and look at the data and think about, you know, if, if that type of access is protective in any way. Because um, certainly from the conversations that I've heard today, it, it could be, um, but I, I, don't, I don't really have a great, a great theory on that, and I'd actually be fascinated to hear from the from the constituents on this call if, if they have theories on it as well. Sure, and 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 if everyone's okay with it, um, you know, to to have a few minutes, uh, George Umbato, since you have member organizations in a lot of these countries that Dr. Gummerson has mentioned, do you have any insights into that, or have you heard from your uh, members there about? the fact that you're seeing this kind of thing across income groups and across families of different incomes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gamson. Uh, I really like the manner in which you presented the regression. Uh, one of the things that I look at in terms of the household, which may be a little bit, uh, I don't know if it's a paradox or a little bit different from what I see on ground. When you talk about food insecurity, you're able to observe that as Malawi, for instance, had indicated that most of the members are rural-based. And uh, we've seen trends where uh, people that live within the rural communities are the ones who are supplying food to their families in the urban setup. So actually what we're observing is there's a lot of food insecurity for those who are living within the urban setup. Uh, but overall, I'm seeing these are really good uh, good research that we need to uh, maybe 
look at the data, particularly the, the raw data, and will help us too as, as, as credit union in the continent because we struggle to have the right information. And this across the board, all countries. Yeah. 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 George, thanks so much. Um, we are over the two hour mark now, and I know a lot of you have work to do and places to be. So I think we're going to uh, conclude at this point. Dr. Gummerson, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and again, um, uh, that is all available on the PMA website, all of that data, if you'd like to go there. I just want to mention again that this entire recording of this webinar will be on our YouTube channel. It'll be available uh, later today. Um, and that's again at youtube.com slash woku slash WCCO, or excuse me, W-O-C-C-U, youtube.com slash W-O-C-C-U. Thanks so much, uh, George Ototo, George Mbato, George Ochiri, Stephen Otieno, and I should say thank you to Stephen Otieno and George Ochiri, who answered a lot of the attendee questions uh, written out in the uh, Q&A section. They went ahead and answered those, so I appreciate that. Um, giving some of those responses. And also thanks to Fumbani Nyungulu from Malawi today. That's gonna do it for our webinar on the Virtual African Financial Symposium. And again, be sure to go to our website, woku.org. You can see more information about that webinar I mentioned earlier on driving digital transformation in the COVID-19 era. You can go to woku.org and find out more information about that. Thank you so much and have a great day.